Good morning, everyone. Uh, we commence our study today in Galatians, and I have the privilege of kicking us off. Um, one of Paul's earliest epistles, if not his earliest, depending on who we think he wrote it to, whether it was North Galatia or the Southern Province. Um, but it's known to be the cornerstone of the Protestant Reform Reformation, the Magna Carta of spiritual freedom. Um, it was instrumental in Martin Luther's coming to the faith when he read that the just shall live by faith. It's considered to be a smaller book of Romans, even though it was written earlier. Um, but it encapsulates the, the core theme of justification by faith. Um, and before we go any further, let's just come to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for um, your word. Thank you that your word is a lamp to our feet, Lord, and we pray that you would open our eyes and soften our hearts to receive what it is you want to say today. Um, we thank you for the perfect righteousness of Christ um, that you are given to us by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Um, please open to Galatians 1, and we'll be focusing mainly on the first 12 chapters today. Oh, sorry, the first 12 verses, 12 chapters. All right. Uh, the Apostle Paul, as we all know, um, his Hebrew name Saul, uh, most likely moved to Jerusalem as a teenager to study under the rabbinical, uh, rabbinical scholar uh, Gamaliel. Uh, he's a devout Pharisee, a zealot, uh, practiced the law of Moses, and uh, was known to be an adversary and a persecutor of Christians. Um, but on the road to Damascus, he encounters the Lord Jesus and before long, he is changed from adversary to advocate, from persecutor to preacher, and would go on to become one of the greatest missionaries the church has ever known. Um, and it's from Paul that we have at least 13 epistles, um, including this le letter to the Galatians. Now, Galatia became a province in the year 25 BC. Um, you could probably see this. Oh, nope, wrong one. There we go. So you can probably see at the top there, it touches the Black Sea and as far south as the Mediterranean um, in, in, in Paul's time and uh, included very, a lot of ethnic groups, um, including the Galatians who migrated from southern France into Asia Minor um, in the, around 278 BC. Um, and there's various, there are varying views on whether the letter is written to the northern province uh, up here or to the southern province of Galatia. Um, mainly because uh, Rome would relocate some of the southern province and the surrounding areas would um, swallow some of the, of, of, of the bottom half here. And so it was assumed by earlier commentators that um, Paul was writing to the later Roman province. Um, but the more widely accepted view is that Paul is addressing um, the churches from his first missionary trip. Um, and we can track that from Acts 13 and 14. Um, and if this is so, then we can date this book back as early as 49 AD. Um, but why does this matter? Um, historically, I think is the only reason, uh, chronologically. Um, but fundamentally, it doesn't change the interpretation of the book. It doesn't change what Paul is trying to say here. Um, so not long after Paul had left the established churches, it seems that disturbed, uh, disturbers or distorters of the gospel had traveled to Galatia and discredited Paul, uh, Paul and his teaching. Um, Jew Christianity started as a Jewish messianic movement um, and the earliest Christians were Jews uh, so you could yep the earliest Christians were Jews but it soon realized that the message of the gospel is not just for the Jews um, but is a message for all of humanity and soon the Jesus movement uh, grows and soon enough um, there's just a, about as many Gentiles in the church as there are Jews. So just by a show of hands, how many of us here are Gentiles? A 
Well, as you look around, there was a time where you would look around and Gentiles would have been the minority. And so as they grow, they, there's, this, there's this increasing tension between the Jews um, and the Gentiles because historically the people of God uh, were distinguished by the law of Moses, the people of Israel, the Jews. And so Jewish Christians at the time argued that in order for Gentiles to be Christians, um, they had to first become Jews uh, by observing certain, certain laws, things such as circumcision, eating kosher, or observing the Sabbath. And some of the Jewish Christians came down from Galatia to undermine Paul, and they were distorting the gospel, um, demanding the circumcision of Gentiles, which many did. And so this led Paul to, let, uh, to pen this letter to the churches out of his dis distress and frustration. Um, you could also follow that through in Acts 15. Paul is engaged in a battle for the gospel in this letter, and his words still speak to us today. He's persuading the believer to continue in the true gospel and to reject all other non-gospels. Uh, Paul will stress the confirmation of one single gospel, but its universal nature open to all people through faith. So these good-looking men here are your Protestant reformers, um, and they disagreed on a lot of things. Uh, government, the Lord's Supper, baptism, you can name it, but there was one thing that they were remarkably united on, and it was this point of doctrine, that we are made right with God through faith in Christ. And it's a burning topic for the Apostle Paul. We see that it's the centrality, the, the centrality of of justification by faith as we work through Galatians. Martin Luther argued that it's the article by which the church stands or falls. And so it's necessary that the doctrine of faith is never lost, that it's always read, that it's always preached, and that it's always taught, no matter how familiar we think we are with it or how well read we think we are. We cannot, easily so, we cannot so easily brush over the truth of salvation because we have an adversary that prowls and seeks to devour us. The father of lies. The God of this world. This evil age. And so we must be equipped. And ready to engage in battle. With the lies and other gospels. As the apostle Paul did. How can a person stand before a holy God. Without being condemned. As believers we can surely fall into doubt. And trials. And we can, try, we can question whether we are right with God. And so we must grasp every day that Christ really is our righteousness. And the key issue that Paul is trying to address in this book is the central issue of human existence. We wrestle with this issue today. Paul struggled with the issue with the Galatians, and it even goes as far back as Job, the oldest, one of the oldest books in the Bible. How can a person be justified before God? How is sinful man made right with holy God? In fact, every world religion aims to answer this question. To some extent, at least, every world religion acknowledges a higher power and aims to appease this power in hope of blessing and to avoid cursing. Buddhism. The human life is one of suffering and that meditation, spiritual and physical labor and good behavior are the ways to achieve, achieve enlightenment or state of nirvana. Islam, they focus most, they believe in faith and good deeds, living religiously, asking for forgiveness and a life of action. Hinduism, believe in karma and reincarnation. The universal cause. The universal casual law by which good or bad actions determine the future modes of an individual's existence. It's a scale of good or bad. Where does the scale tip? Karma literally means deed or act. You get what you give. The new ager aims to be their own God. The spiritual authority of self. Every religion seeks to find a way to God. Every world religion provides hell's answer. And as Paul would argue, only the gospel has the way to salvation. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Matthew 7, 
verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. One of the most offensive things, in fact, that we can say today is Jesus is the way to eternal life. To preach faith in Jesus is to go against every world religion and every claim to life. It robs people of their sense of virtue and uprightness. But in fact, yet if I change just one of these words, the world becomes my best friend. I'm going to change the slide and just try to see which word changes. So we go from Jesus is the way to eternal life to Jesus is a way to eternal life. We change one word. And Jesus goes from being the only way to one of many ways. Avianca flight 52 was regularly scheduled to uh, fly from Colombia to New York and it crashed on January, 20, January 25th, 1990. Um, Eight of nine crew members and 65 people were killed on board. The flight left with more than enough fuel for the journey and progressed towards uh, its destination. And while they were flying, they were placed on three holding patterns um, due to poor communication between the air crew and air traffic controllers, as well as an inadequate management of fuel load by the pilots. The flight became critically low on fuel this dire situation was not recognized as an emergency by the controllers because of failure of the pilots to use the word emergency. The plane was placed on a priority holding pattern and ran out of fuel and crashed. 70 peop 72 people died because of the difference between two words, priority and emergency. Do we think that God takes his word seriously? We must have the courage to proclaim that there is no other way to salvation. That we are not saved by living a good life, but only through faith in Jesus Christ. Acts 4 verse 12, nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is no other gospel. God has declared the means by which man can be made right in his sight. To be justified is to be righteous. To be righteous is to be justified. These are legal terms. It's by faith that we are justified, that we are declared righteous by God. God as the divine judge will either acquit us or condemn us. How can we be acquitted of our guilt? Through doing good? It reminds me of a man who on his deathbed becomes aware of the sinful life that he lived. The reality of condemnation or damnation is near. And so he thinks to himself, if only I had more time, I could right the wrongs. If only I had more time, I could do more good things. I could repay those I hurt, return what I stole, then I might have peace. Job is a man who was of, who was of integrity. He feared God and he turned away from evil but he wrestles with this idea of being justified by his righteousness job chapter 9 14 to 15 is that there yes it is how then can i answer him and choose my words before him for though i were right i could not answer i would have to implore the mercy of my judge and the answer is that we can never expect to be made right with god based on our own merit as the psalm says, all have turned away, all alike have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. The King James uses the term filthy. All alike have become filthy. There is no one who does good, not even one. But surely our deeds are worth something. Isaiah says otherwise, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And all we do, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. The Bible is very clear that we cannot be justified before God by anything that we do. The righteous deeds of man can never acquit him of his guilt. No matter how much good we try to do, no matter how many laws we try to obey, 
we are corrupt and our iniquity has removed us from any sort of right standing with a holy God. We're all familiar with the verse in Romans, for all have sinned and fall short. But there's grace in Christ. And so since we cannot reach God by our own efforts, God reaches us by his effort. The righteousness which we could never actively attain is attributed to us in Christ. The satisfaction and perfect obedience of Christ is credited to the believer. He who has faith is bonded to Christ in his death and resurrection. Paul writes in Galatians 3 that we are clothed in Christ. We are clothed in his righteousness. And God is satisfied to declare us so. How can man stand before a holy God without being condemned? Nothing short of the perfect righteousness of Christ will do. Nothing else will suffice. And we cannot add or subtract, earn or pay. If I aim to be justified by my own merit, then I'm under the law. And I reject Christ. And I set to earn a right standing with God. And God who is just will give me my wages. Galatians 3 says that everyone, Galatians chapter 3 tells us, let everyone who does not do everything in the book of the law let everyone who does not do everything in the book of the law is cursed. God is just and he will pay the worker his wages. We work nothing in Christ. We're clothed in his righteousness. And it's here that we work nothing. We render nothing to God. We only receive and permit someone to work in us. Namely the spirit of Christ. This is the distinguishing mark of God's people the indwelling of Christ. And it's from this that God enables us to live a life free from bondage and sin. And this is what the Apostle Paul sets out to defend in Galatians. So junk mail. Um, we live in a, in a uh, how do you say, tech era, I guess, for lack of a better word. But um, a junk mail, it just, piles up at the front desk at my house. My grandma used to make us collect uh, chicken bones in them before we put them in the bin. Um, but pretty much no one, no one likes the junk mail. But what happens when the junk mail, the returning address on it says ATO? Um, I bet everyone wants to know what that letter says. And you would want to know uh, what the ATO wants to say to you. Um, Yes. Well, it's Paul's apostolic authority that's being uh, attacked here. And so one of the indications that the opposers or the distorters of the gospel were undermining his authority is that he immediately goes on the defensive in the first couple of verses. Um, they probably discredited his apostleship, saying that he wasn't one of the 12. Um, but Paul comes charging out of the gate, reaffirming the legitimacy of his apostleship. And that it does not come from human origin. Paul, an apostle, not from men or by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Um, and so it's his apostolic authority that he's defending here. He was being challenged and so the gospel he, he was preaching was also being challenged. The church is built on apostolic authority. It's the eyewitness accounts that the church is uh, built on. Jesus commissioned people who were, who were with him in his ministry that witnessed his death and his resurrection. Um, and it's this eyewitness authority uh, that the preaching comes from, the apostolic preaching. Apostle, one who was sent. Paul never claims to be one of the 12, but he makes it clear so the reader is not mistaken. He was commissioned directly by the same Christ who commissioned Peter and the others as a special apostle for the Gentiles. And we can see this in Acts 26, verse 16. Reading from verse 16. But get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant 
and a witness of those you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and share among those who are sanctified by, wait for it, faith in me. Paul was not just one who was sent, for there were people that were sent by men. Some of these opposers perhaps came from Jerusalem being sent by the apostles claiming authority. They were sent by men. And so Paul is defending his authority that he was not sent by men. He's not an apostle by men's authority, but by God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. Notice in verse 2 as well that he says, and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. This is to show that the gospel preached by Paul is not one that he proclaims alone. That the brothers with him affirm his gospel. And it's not just, and it isn't one that includes circumcision. Reading in Galatians 1 verse 3, Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of God and Father. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The churches were likely, well, the Gentiles were likely afraid of disobeying the law of God. It was given by God. Um, and so notice Paul's language here. He uses terms like grace and peace, saying that grace and peace is afforded by Jesus who gave himself according to the will of God and our father. Not the father, but our father. That this grace and peace is pleasing to God. To establish that we are adopted as sons and daughters through Jesus. Christ has made his father our father. Verse 6. I am amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ. And are turning to a different gospel. Now this is in contrast to the rest of Paul's epistles. He, he doesn't give a prayer of thanksgiving like he does in in, in other epistles. Um, but rather he's astonished. Um, he's distressed that they are abandoning the only hope for forgiveness of sins. Those words so quickly is echoed in the Israel golden calf incident. In fact, it's the same words used in the, in the Greek Old Testament um, so quickly. Here we have Exodus 32. Verse 8, they have quickly turned from the way I commanded them. They have made for themselves an, an image of a calf. They have bowed down to it, sacrificed to it, and said, Israel, these are your gods who, you brought, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now, the people of Israel had been liberated from Egypt, from slavery, from bondage, and they had entered covenant with God at Mount Sinai. And when Moses ascends up into the mountain, they create and worship a golden calf and they turn away from the Lord. And Paul is shocked. The people of Galatia seem to be repeating the same mistake, departing from God shortly after being delivered. And we get a sense of how shocked he is by how passionate he is in the next, in the following verses. Reading from verse 7. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are troubling you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, a curse be on him. As we have said before, I now say again, if anyone preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, a curse be on him. And this is very strong language. He uses this strong language to show the unchangeable nature of the gospel. Do we think that God takes his word seriously? Those proclaiming a false gospel are accursed in some translations because there is no other truth. The gospel spread by intruders is no gospel at all. 
And those who distort the real gospel are worthy of damnation. Scripture is God-breathed, and how serious do we think God takes his word? If all scripture is inspired by God, breathed by God, it's the very breath of God from his mouth, it's his word. And so there's eternal consequences and everlasting ramifications when we, when we distort this. Because there is no other truth and there is no other way to salvation. By adding the requirement of circumcision, food culture, and Sabbath keeping, they have rejected the sufficiency and grace of Christ. In the 19th century, a man named Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon church, claimed to have been visited by an angel who, who gave him a divine revelation, divine revelation um, that the gospel message had been lost. I have an article here from the LDS website. Latter-day Saints teach, teaching state that where we go after this life depends primarily upon the degree to which we accept and follow Jesus Christ, as well as on the desires of our hearts and how we translate those desires into works. In addition, our destination after this life depends on whether we participate in essential rites, such as baptism, and that aid us in the process of repentance, progression, and sanctification. This is not the gospel. Every day we must cling to the sufficiency of Christ. Grasp and take hold that he is our righteousness. There is nothing new under the sun. And Satan has been trying to pervert the truth since the beginning. Just as he, just as he did in the time of Paul. And just as he, as he did in the 19th century in upstate New York. And still very much today. Abandon everything you think you can do. Throw yourself into the sufficient grace given to us through the Lord Jesus. Embrace him with empty hands. As Job says, we can only hope to implore the mercy of our judge. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the events that you allowed to happen, Father. And that we are able to know the truth of salvation, that it comes by faith alone in your son. Thank you that we are able to trade our filthy rags, Lord for his righteousness, for the robes of righteousness. We pray, Lord, that we would cling to the gospel, um, that you would give us wisdom and discernment to know the, the dangers that this world um, aims to lure us into. Um, help us to cling to faith alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.